And one thing that I really like to think about is art. Right? So I figured I'd start off with a little game of show and tell. I want to show you some of my absolute favorite artworks. We'll do like a top three. Right? First, Marcel Duchamp, 1919, LHOQ. Right? So if you're not familiar with this work, it's just a cheap little black and white reproduction of the Mona Lisa. And if you look closely, you'll see a little mustache and goatee just drawn on with pen or pencil or something. Right? Mind blowing. I love this piece. LHOQ is the title. Doesn't stand for anything, but if any of you speak French, you'll know it's pr when those letters are pronounced in French, it forms a kind of racy sentence. You can Google it if you want to know what it is. LHOQ. Number two on my top three list that I'd like to show you. Robert Rauschenberg's 1953 Erase de Kooning drawing. Right? Another really moving, wonderful piece. History here is uh, de Kooning did a drawing, and then Rauschenberg, with de Kooning's permission, erased that drawing, and then presented it as his own original contribution to the art world. So now it's seen in galleries and such. It's erased de Kooning drawing. It's exactly what it says it is. It's two. Those two were more in the visual arts, kind of. The third one, not so much. Robert Berry's 1969, All the Things I Know But of Which I Am Not at the Moment Thinking, 1.36 PM, June 15th, 1969. This piece is a little bit more strange. It's, the work is not those letters arranged in that way. That's just something to focus on when contemplating the work. The work is exactly what it says. The work is all of the things that Robert Berry knows but was not thinking at the moment, uh, 1.36 PM, June 15th. 1969. So what is being presented here as an artwork is actually an, a, a body of knowledge, wh whatever that actually is. Right? I love these works. And I say that completely seriously, completely non-sarcastically. These are, in some sense, artistically moving for me. But I get frustrated, because when I tell people about my taste in art and the artworks that I like, I get a very common reaction. Right? Whether it's on the first day of an aesthetics class I'm teaching, whether it's uh, from, from my mother, uh, whether it's from who's going to be watching this talk, so sorry, Mom. Um, whether it's from uh, my, my single serving friend on the flight here, right? I get this really common reaction, just sort of an exasperated sigh, some eye rolling, and acclaim. That's not art. Right? And I think this is a pretty common reaction for people to have. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking to you about my claim in response. I want to try to convince you that usually when someone says, that's not art, they're wrong. OK. You might be thinking, OK, I thought this was a philosophy lecture series. Why is this dude up here talking about art so much? Well, philosophers like to think hard questions about lots of different things. So the last talk touched on the philosophy of religion. right? You could also do the philosophy of mathematics. You could do the philosophy of language. Well, I do philosophy of art. And what is that? It's critical inquiry into concepts fundamental to artistic practice. Right? So we've got this big, messy practice that we involve ourselves in of making artworks, of engaging with them, appreciating them, dealing them, curating them, criticizing them, and so on and so forth. And there are some concepts, some shared concepts that we have that kind of unify this practice, give us some common ground. Concepts like art, artwork, the art world, aesthetic experience, aesthetic appreciation. We could add to that list. right? So I'm not an art historian. I'm not going to tell you about movements throughout art history and how they've influenced one another. I could talk a little bit about that, but that's, that's not really what I do. Right? I'm not an art critic. I'm not going to give you principled reasons to think that you should prefer these kinds of art over those kinds of art. I mean, we could chat about that, but I don't really have any credentials there. Right? Instead, I'm a philosopher art, of art. I'm interested in looking at these concepts and figuring out, given all this messy data out there in our practice of engaging with and making art, how to make the most sense of it. Right? So another way of thinking of it is I take art and then I squeeze all of the life out of it. <laughs> right? It's fun. So OK, usually when someone says that's not art, I want to say they've said something false. And you might think, well, who are you to tell me what is and what isn't art? That's a little imperialistic. You might think, I know what I think art is. You, know, uh, you Wesley, you know what you think art is. 
So maybe something that's art for me isn't art for you. Or maybe that stuff that you showed earlier. Ah. So I used to teach a class where I had to wear one of these. And uh, I was telling the folks before the talk that I knew I was going to drop it somehow because I did all the time in that lecture. And now I will make it work somehow. Can you hear me? Awesome. Got it together. Uh, let's see. What was the last thing I said before that? Ah, me being imperialistic, telling you what art is, right? Isn't this kind of open to interpretation? Don't we have our own views on what art is? Maybe you're one of these folks who thinks, if I think it's art, then it's art for me. Maybe you say the for me. Maybe you leave it implied. Maybe you don't realize it's there. It probably is there. But you say, look, if I think it's art, then by my lights, it's art. And it's OK for us to disagree. And that's cool. You're entitled to your opinion. I won't fight you over it. But I will try to give you some reasons why I think you might want to give this sort of claim up. Right? Here are a few. Well, sometimes someone offers this as an answer to the question of what is art. And they're like, eh, well, it's hard. You know, like, we all have our own views. What is art? Well, it's, you know, if it's art for me, then it's art for me. You know, if you think it's art, then it's art for you. And I just want to point out how successful that response is at not answering the question at all. Right? So take out the word art and think about another word. Um, I assume none of you know what a mafufnik is. I don't either. Right? But if you ask me what a mafufnik is and I say, well, you know, it's, it's hard. But if I say it's a mafufnik, if I think it's a mafufnik, then it's a mafufnik for me. It's like, OK, great. You've told me some fact, but you haven't answered the question. You've given me a completely uninformative statement. There's also this worry that this might be completely redundant and trivial. So this claim, it's art for me, sounds to my ears a lot like just saying, I think it's art, just in different words. So what you're telling me is if you think it's art, then you think it's art? Awesome. I will grant you that, always. But you might be wrong. Our art judgments might be fallible. Right? For example, if someone comes up to me and they say, hey, man, the Mona Lisa, that's not an artwork. And uh, your left shoe, that is. I'm going to think that their art judgments are a little bit off. right? I'm going to think, yeah, I don't think you really know what the word art means. Or you're using it in a way that's so drastically different from the way that we tend to use it that we're not really speaking the same language. Right? There is massive convergence about what people agree about is art, what people agree about isn't art. There's some fringe cases. right? There's some controversies, but we got the paradigms on both sides of the question. Right? In fact, if you and I were to debate about whether the Mona Lisa is art, it would feel like we're actually disagreeing, I think. If I say the Mona Lisa is art, and you say, no, the Mona Lisa is not art, we're, we're not just talking about ourselves and our feelings and what we personally believe. right? Because then if we interpret it that way, there's no real disagreement going on. But it sure does feel like we're disagreeing in this context. And not only that, we're giving reasons. I can say, you should think that the Mona Lisa is art for these reasons. And you would say, oh, you should think it's not for these other reasons. And this giving of reasons suggests, perhaps, that there's some standard that we're working with here, right? some unified central concept that we're arguing about how to apply it. And it's good to have that standard. Right? So every year, the government, the US government, gives out tens of thousands of dollars to artists through the National Endowment for the Arts, through grants funded by tax dollars. And if we just go with this, ah, if I think it's art, then it's arts for me standard for spending your tax money, that might be a little unsatisfying. Right? You might think, no, it'd be good to have some standard other than just whoever evaluates the grants going with whatever arbitrary views she happens to have about art at the time. Right? So I want to say, yeah, there is a standard answer to this question. We can give reasons. We can make cases for why certain things should be considered art, certain things should not be considered art. It's not just all up for grabs. Now, when you do the philosophy of art, a distinction you'll encounter pretty early on is this distinction between two kinds of theories of art. 
One is a classificatory theory, and these, comes in, these come in many different shapes. These are theories that help us determine which objects are artworks and which ones are not. So you got your big pile of objects, you take something from it, you hold it up, you look at it through your classificatory theory, it tells you whether to put it in the art pile or the not art pile. But then you've also got commendatory theories. What are these? These are theories which help you figure out, once you've got an artwork, whether it's a good one or a bad one. So when you've got your pile of art objects, you hold one of them up, you look at it through your commendatory theory, it tells you whether to put it in the good art pile or the bad art pile. Right? Now notice, you can't even start using your commendatory theory until you've done your classificatory work. You can't know which things are good and bad art until you've figured out whether they're art in the first place. Right? Now this idea that art is somehow relative can be kind of captured here. You might think, look, there's no disputing taste. And you might go relativist with your commendatory theory and think that's a matter of personal choice. But that's not to say that it is in the classificatory sense. That might be objective, what is versus what isn't art. And then the good versus bad art distinction might be where our own personal sentiments come in. Now, the late Arthur Danto, who is one of the greatest philosophers of art there's ever been and probably ever will be, pointed out that a lot of times when someone says that something is not art, they're really just saying that it's bad art. Right? We tend to use the word art and artwork and work of art as compliments, and we withhold them when we want to show some sort of displeasure with something. And this seems to be a straightforward result of just conflating the classificatory and commendatory theories. Right? We're speaking like we're classifying, but what we're really doing is evaluating. So if Danto's right, and I think he is, then a lot of times when people say, oh, that's not art, literally what they've said is false. It is art. They're just asserting that it's bad art, which then directly follows from it. Yes, it is in fact art. If it's bad art, then it's art. Right? So I think that accounts for a very large class of utterances for when people say, that's not art. Speaking non-literally, they're speaking evaluatively rather than classifying. Maybe you think, that's not what I'm doing. You're like, no, no, I'm not just saying I don't like these pieces. I'm saying something stronger. I'm classifying. I want to say that these works aren't works because they're failing to do what art is supposed to do. Okay. That's fair. You know, you see uh, LHOQ in a museum and you're like, that's not art because it's not doing the right thing. Okay. If you have a view like that, you probably adopt what's called a functional theory of art. And there are a bunch of different versions of functional theories, but they all boil, boil down to the same rough idea. They're classificatory theories, so they're theories which tell us the artworks from the non-artworks, that attempt to define art in terms of some particular function. Right? So maybe you think, as people did for a long time, that artworks are in the business of uh, imitating or representing. So the associated theory would be the mimetic theory. Something is an artwork if it's an artifact intended to serve as a representation. Or maybe you think that artworks are in the business of expressing emotions. Right? So the functional theory there would be something is an artwork if it's, a, the, if it's an object intended to express an emotion. Right? Some folks have thought that something is an artwork if it plays the role of playing around with significant forms, whatever that means. Right? So something is an artwork if it's an object intended to display interesting forms. Maybe you think artworks are in the business of giving us aesthetic experiences. So something is an artwork if it's an object intended to offer us those kinds of experiences. Right? We could go on and on, coming up with different simple functional theories here. So we might say something is not art if it, whatever theory we adopt, if it doesn't do, doesn't fulfill the function assigned to it by that theory. The problem with simple functional theories in general is that the art world is messy. It is dynamic. It is adventurous. It is not well behaved. You present an artist with a functional theory of art, you give that artist 10 minutes, and they will make a counterexample to it. Okay. So coming up with a functional theory that isn't going to sort of just capture a small sliver of a snapshot of art history is going to be very, very difficult. Okay. So instead, the view that, that I'm quite fond of is to not think of art in terms of what it's supposed to do, but flip that around. And think that an art, something is an artwork based on what we do with it. And here we get a version of what has been called oh, an institutional theory. The idea here 
is that artworks are artifacts that have been introduced in the right way by the right people as objects for a particular loosely social institutional activity. This is very hand wavy, right? This is a version of an institutional theory that, you know, it's not the ones you'll find in the textbooks. I can, we can get into more detail during the Q&A if you want to get into the real nuts and bolts of it. But the idea is roughly something like this. Look, we have this practice. We have this game that people play out there. Right? And the artworks are like the hacky sacks that they're kicking around. You've got the artist, and they're like, hey guys, here we go. I'm going to throw this into the middle. Audiences, try to appreciate it. Critics, criticize it. Curators, uh, arrange it with other things. Dealers, sell it to somebody. Historians, you, you should catalog this whole process for the records. Right? On this view, there's this large, loosely formed social institution that's engaged in playing this game. And all it is to be an artwork is to be thrown in the middle, along with an invitation for the players to play their game with that thing. Now, this sets the bar for what it takes to be an artwork incredibly low. Right? How hard is it to make a work of art? Well. Let's say I'm one of the right people. That just means I'm somehow affiliated with the art world. I want to make my left shoe into art. I just throw it in, metaphorically. I don't actually have to throw it. But I'm just like, I hereby present this as something for you to play this game with. Boom, it's an artwork. So it's remarkably easy to make art. It's remarkably hard to make art that's interesting and worth looking at. Right? But pretty much, you walk into a museum, you see something, strikes you as, eh, doesn't strike me as art. Ask how it got there. And on this view, it probably is. So if you say that something's not art, you're probably either in the grips of a fragile, functional theory of art, or you're just conflating classification with commendation. But perhaps you're thinking, OK, no, hold on. There are lots of times when I can say that's not art, and I'm saying something perfectly true. Like when I'm walking down the street with a friend, and we see a stop sign, and I say, hey, that, that's not art. Right? And I see, I point at the road, I'm like, that's not art. Those all seem to be true, right? Because they haven't been introduced into this game that we play. Well, I, I grant that that's right, right. But so there's this philosopher named Paul Grice a while back. And Grice had an interesting observation about language. He points out, look, our language doesn't just follow rules of grammar and punctuation and sentence structure, but there are certain conversational rules that that are, are sort of re, uh, recognized when we're trying to talk each at each other. So we're not just talking at each other, but we're actually communicating in a certain way. There are restrictions on what we say, what we don't say. So for example, you walk up to me and you're like, hey, Wesley, how's it going? And I say, good, one plus one equals two. That's kind of the conversational equivalent of a typo. You're going to be left wondering, why, why did he say that? That's irrelevant. It's conversationally inappropriate. So yeah, I grant you, you might walk down the street not talking about philosophy of art you know, and just say, that's not art, that's not art, that's not art. But that'd be like walking down the street and saying, there's a car, there's a car, there's a car. Grice's rule that governs our conversations is basically just be relevant or else it's not clear what your contribution is supposed to be doing. So the claim is, all of these other true utterances of that's not art out there, are usually, when they're uttered, going to be conversationally inappropriate. So, I'll remind you of my claim. Usually, when someone says that's not art, they're wrong. We looked a little bit at whether there's an objective answer to this question. It gave us some reasons to think that there are, or at least some reasons to think that the claim that there aren't is problematic. We looked at the distinction between classificatory versus commendatory theories. We looked at simple functional theories in contrast to institutional theories, learned a little bit about conversational appropriateness. So with all of that under our belts, I can state the claim more carefully now as this. Usually when someone says, that's not art, in a conversationally appropriate manner, they're either, one, conflating commendation with classification, or two, assuming a fragile and probably false functional theory of art, and hence, Probably wrong. I leave you with a fourth of my favorite works, Trebuchet by Duchamp, which is a simple, unaltered coat rack. Thank you.